what we do now on earth will determine what we will be doing later in heaven. Let that sink in a little bit. How we live as a Christian on this earth will determine what kind of life we will have as a residence of heaven. Now, do you really believe that? Because if we do, it would really make a, a, a traumatic difference, dramatic difference in, in how we live. Some Christians live as if they don't care. Uh, they live as if they're not aware that it does count right now for eternity how we live. Now, many Christians mistakenly think that how they live uh, on earth doesn't really matter because they're in the kingdom. And so uh, the life in the kingdom was, will just be um, all great. And the eternal estate, some think we'll all just share equally. When we get to heaven, that's all that matters. Well, I got some news for you. That's, it's not true that we'll, we'll all be share equally in, uh, in the rewards of heaven. There will be various levels of greatness or rewards in heaven. And some think that uh, to be saved from hell is all that matters as far as eternity goes. And they have the idea that uh, Christ is preparing a place and that's all that matters and they give no thought about how they live that that will impact the size and the place of that heavenly dwelling place. So there's a developing an attitude of indifference among Christians today. And so what if everything is burned up at the judgment seat of Christ as long as I'm saved, everything will be great, right? No more tears, right? My friend and author and mentor and missionary Jody Dillow writes this. But I believe there are good reasons why there will be tears in heaven. When we reflect upon how we live for Christ who purchased us with such a high cost, we might well weep on the other side of the celestial gates. Our tears will be those of regret and shame, tears of remorse for the lives lived for ourselves rather than for Him who loves us and releases us from our sins by His blood. You know, many mistakenly think that the judgment seat of Christ is a not very significant event. That uh, they think that, well, there cannot be really a serious review of our life as a Christian because all our sins are forgiven at the cross. Right? That is true. Cast in the deepest sea, far as the east is from the west. You know, that's true. But after we're converted, uh, our works for Christ do carry some weight. And it's not a merit for our salvation because that's a free gift that we have by believing in Jesus Christ. But what we do with our life as a Christian does earn rewards that will be recognized at the judgment seat of Christ. So what does the Bible have to say about this upcoming judgment of believers? What is the truth about what happens when believers' lives are evaluated? This morning we're going to study an event known as the judgment seat of Christ. So we want to look at some biblical insights into the judgment seat of Christ and the Apostle Paul speaks of this event in Romans chapter 14, verses 10 to 12, as well as some other passages that we'll look at this morning. But in Romans, the Apostle Paul brings up this event of future judgment in the believer's life uh, in the context of Christians that are judging one another. Uh, the weak brethren, weak in faith, they're judging the strong in faith. And the, and the strong in faith are judging the weak in faith. And so it's in the middle of this that, that he, he writes, why do you judge your brother? Uh, and again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? We'll all stand before the judgment of God, the judgment seat of God. And, so, and each one of us will give an account of himself to God. So from this passage and others that speak about the judgment of Christ, we want to make six 
insights. Look at six insights about the coming event known as the judgment seat of Christ. Now, the first insight is that the people appearing before the judgment seat are individual believers. Only Christians will be standing at the judgment seat of Christ. And we discover this from verse 10 in our passage, where it says, Why do you judge your brother? Why do you regard with your contempt, brother with contempt? We shall all stand before the judgment seat. So th this is addressed to brothers. Brother, why do you judge your brother? And why do you regard your brother with contempt? We shall all stand as brothers and sisters in Christ before the judgment seat of Christ. So the word brother is a technical term that describes a person who's put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They're part of the family of God. They're related to each other by their faith in Jesus Christ. And so the we shall all stand. Paul includes himself there and the people he's writing to in Rome, the Christians he's writing to in Rome. He says, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So who will be judging the believers at this judgment seat? God the Father and God the Son will both be present at this event. But who will actually do to the judging? Is it God or is it Christ? I believe it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, how do we know? Well, um, as we look at the believers there at the Lord Jesus that, that, that will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, in John chapter 5, it's because the, the judgment seat of Christ is not for unbelievers. It's just for people who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And the issue is not salvation, it's service. The issue is not whether they're going to get into heaven or not, it's what they're going to be doing in heaven. And so the only believers will be, be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. And, uh, and notice that as far as the judging goes, uh, John 5, 22, not even the Father judges anyone, for he has given all judgment to the Son. So the Jesus is going to be doing the judgment. But God's there, and that's why in Romans 14 it, the event is called, in many translations, the judgment seat of God. But if you look at the Greek manuscripts, the majority of Greek manuscripts have judgment seat of Christ, although some of the translations say judgment seat of God, but both are going to be there. But in the letter to the Corinthians, the same event is called the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10, Therefore we have it as our admission, whether to be at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him, to the Lord. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may be recompensed or paid or rewarded for his deeds in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. So the first observation has to do that only believers are going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. The second observation is there's another judgment coming. And only unbelievers will be judged at the great white throne judgment. The Bible speaks of two very different judgments, future judgments. One judgment is for believers only, the judgment seat of Christ. The other judgment is called the great white throne judgment, and it's only for unbelievers. And we read about this in Revelation Revelation 20, this is the end of the millennial kingdom. Christ has come, he's set up his kingdom, he's reigned for a thousand years, and here's what's going to happen at the end of that thousand year period. He says, the rest of the, he says, I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was given to them. And uh, he says, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Why? Over these, the second death has no power. What's the second death? We'll find out in just a second. They will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. That's because these believers have been judged at the judgment seat of Christ. And now, based on their rewards, they'll be reigning or not reigning with Jesus Christ in the millennial kingdom. 
uh, just because they'll be in the kingdom, but they may not have a position of authority in the kingdom based on how they've lived in this life. When the thousand years are completed, so the millennial kingdom is coming to an, a close, Satan is released. He's been bound for a thousand years. And, but Satan at the end of the millennial kingdom is going to be released from his prison. And he will come and deceive the nations, which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for war. And the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they will come on a broad plain of the earth and surround the camp of the saints that are the believers and the beloved city, Jerusalem, here. And fire will come down from heaven and devour Satan and all the people that have rebelled with him at the end of the millennial kingdom. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, and where the beast and the false prophet are also. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And then I saw a great white throne. This is where we get the name of this judgment for unbelievers, the great white throne judgment. And him who sat upon it, from whose presence the earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, the, the, the mighty and the little guy, um, standing before the throne. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books, plural, according to their deeds. This is a judgment of works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death the lake of fire. So now we have a definition of what the second death is, it's being thrown into the lake of fire, which we commonly call hell. This, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So it's kind of like a check and a balance, what God does in the great white throne judgment, because everybody that's there from all time are going to be the unbelievers. There will be no believers at the great white throne judgment. It's all unbelievers. The, they're raised from all time. The unbelievers from all time are raised to come before the judgment seat of Christ. And, the, and they are judged according to their works. And you say, well, I thought we weren't judged according to our works. Well, he looks at the, at the books who are open, and they're judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Okay, but there was another book there, the book of life. And so, um, oh, get ahead of myself. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown in the lake of fire. So it's a double check. Person is coming there, they're, they're judged for their sin. And they're looking, and he looks at the book, he's seen what they're done, and nothing that they've done is good enough to see if your name's been written in the book of life. And so God checks in these books, and the book of life is open. And if your name's written in the book of life, then you're, you're not, you get a pass. Uh, but the problem is nobody at the great white throne judgment has their name written in the book of life. Uh, because that's only for the believers. Believers have their name written in the book of life. And the way you get your name written in the book of life is by believing in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. So this throne, uh, great white throne judgment, is only for unbelievers. Now some believers, some Christians, and some churches teach there's only one final judgment. And at that time, it's determined whether you go to heaven or hell. A lot of churches teach that. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches there are two different future judgments. First is the judgment seat of Christ for believers, and the second is the great white throne judgment. There are two different judgments. Two different peoples are there. Two different times. This happen, They don't happen at the same time. There's a thousand years time difference between the two judgments. And there are two different outcomes. 
So let's, and I've got a chart, and this is on the back of your bulletin insert if you want to want to copy of this or look at this. But this is a chart just contrasting the two future judgments. We have the judgment seat of Christ. And so who's going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ? The saved. Only believers come before the judgment seat of Christ. But at the great white throne, who is being judged? It's the unsaved. And so what is being judged? Well, at both judgments, works are being evaluated. So in the great white throne, excuse me, at the judgment seat of Christ, the believer's works are evaluated. They're judged. But not in order to get to heaven. They're already in heaven when this judgment takes place. So they're already in heaven. So this evaluation is for what they have done with their life, the works that they have done, whether they've done the good works that God has prepared before them to walk in them, whether they've been obedient to Christ, how they've lived their Christian life. That kind of work will be evaluated here and rewarded accordingly. But at the great white throne, only unbelievers are there, and they're evaluated according to their works, and none of their works merit the forgiveness of sin, because nothing we can do in terms of our works as an unbeliever can merit God declaring us righteous. And so they're found guilty, but they're judged for their works and found guilty for their sin. Now, when will this happen? Well, the time of the judgment seat is r just prior to the millennial kingdom or shortly thereafter. There's a little disagreement about there. Some think it happens right at the rapture. Some think it happens in a period of time uh, between the time of the, the rapture and the time the, um, the, um, the millennium starts. So uh, sometime before the millennium. Uh, then the great white throne judgment happens after the millennium. It's after the thousand-year kingdom. It's at the end of the thousand-year kingdom. So there's thousand years between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. How are they judged? Well, they're judged by giving a personal account. Each one of us shall give an account for how we've lived at the judgment seat of Christ. At the great white throne judgment, they're judged according to the books, the book of their deeds and the book of, the, of life and, and found guilty and thrown at the lake of fire. Now, why are they judged? In the judgment seat of Christ, they are, they are, the purpose of this judgment is for reward. It's to give them rewards or, to, um, or they will experience a loss of reward. So... Uh, but for the judgment seat of Christ, uh, uh, the, the issue is rewards. But the great white throne judgment, the issue is for sin. Uh, the judgment seat of Christ, sin's taken care of. There's, sin's not judged at the judgment seat of Christ. That's taken care of at the cross. So that's not what's being evaluated. What's being evaluated is how we have served the Lord and what we've done for the Lord, whether it's good motives or bad motives. And uh, so, but for the great white throne judgment, they, they are accountable for their sin, personal sin. And then the result of these judgments is quite different because the result of the judgment seat is not getting into heaven. They're already there. The result is the various kinds of rewards that they carry over into the kingdom. And then on out, I think, through all eternity, the new heaven and new earth. And so... Uh, but the great white throne judgment, the end result is uh, they're not in heaven and they never will be. They will be thrown into the lake of fire, which is called the second death in Scripture. And, uh, and there's that lasts for eternity, be separated from God for eternity. So the outcomes of these judgments are very different. So it's very important that we make a distinction between the judgment seat of Christ and the great white throne judgment. Now, where will this happen? The judgment seat of Christ will happen at a place that's called the Bema, the Bema seat. It's used two times of the place where Jesus uh, was judged by Pilate. 
used three times of the ruling position of, of Gallio uh, and where he judged. He used three times the ruling platform of Festus uh, in Acts. It's used three times the places where God or Christ will judge. It's a race platform of judgment. It's a race platform for the purpose of judgment. And it was a structure in the, in the Romans uh, where this raised platform was used for judgment. Now, in the Greek culture, they also had a bema. And it was a raised platform. And at the original Olympic Games in Greece, the stadium erected a large platform and a prominent raised position where it was a victory platform in which the winners stood and they were given their crowns. And so that was also a picture of this. So historically, uh, Bema was a place of judgment and it was a place of reward. Uh, but don't confuse the two future judgments. So the placement of the judgment seat is, is important as well. So the place in time where these judgments happen is important. And so there's a time marker about when these happen. The first time marker is the judgment seat of Christ happens right after the rapture. And how much, you know, whether there's a, a, a time gap there, we don't know whether it happens instantaneously at the rapture or whether it takes place over the period of seven years in the judgment seat in the, during the tribulation. So, but it takes place after the rapture of the church. The church is gone and they're being evaluated by this time. And we read about this uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4, the rapture of the church. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall also meet, always be with the Lord. So at the rapture, Jesus comes back in the clouds. He doesn't come to earth. He just comes in the clouds, calls up all those who believed in Christ. And so those who have died believing in Christ will be, have a resurrection body as they're caught up to be with Christ. If we're alive and remain and haven't died, then our bodies will be changed into a resurrection body to go join them at the rapture, in the clouds, as Jesus takes us back into heaven, and so we'll always be with the Lord. Where he is, we are. So when he goes back into heaven, we're there in paradise, awaiting his second coming. And so, um, so this takes place after the church, but it also takes place before the return of Christ, or the second coming of Christ to earth. And so this is a, the second coming of Christ, and this is a, a different event. And so at the second coming of Christ to earth, he will establish his kingdom, and all the raptured saints, uh, believers, who have received their rewards of the judgment seat of Christ will enter into the kingdom. And the question is, how will they, they, they are in heaven, in paradise, but this entrance into the millennial kingdom. Will it be full of rewards or will there be hardly any rewards at all? Well, Peter tells us if you live for Christ in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. That's the rewards. The abundant supply is the rewards that you have as you enter into the millennial kingdom, whether you'll be serving and reigning and how you'll be serving and reigning and how close to Christ you'll be serving and reigning uh, will depend on how you've lived on this earth and the rewards that you've been re received at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I want to clear up a little confusion here. Let's just look at a timeline of these two future judgments. You have eternity past. You have God calling uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and forming the nation of Israel, and uh, giving covenants to them, and uh, and then you have Christ coming, and uh, Christ was coming, and He wanted to set up His kingdom then, 
Uh, the kingdom is near. The kingdom is at hand. That's how, that was the message. That was preaching. And if Israel would have accepted Christ as their Messiah, Christ would have become king and set up his kingdom at that time. But that wasn't God's plan. God's plan was that Christ would come as a suffering servant to die for our sin. And, and Israel rejected Christ as their Messiah. And so uh, three days after Christ was crucified, he was resurrected. And so now we're living in the age of the church. And this is described in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Uh, John writes letters to the seven different churches there. But then the next event, I believe, will happen is the rapture of the church. Jesus comes down from heaven doesn't touch earth. He's up in the clouds. And so he's calling the church. He's calling those who believed in Christ. Uh, the dead who have died and the people who are living will be raptured and he will call them up together with him. That's what the word rapture means, to seize or snatch up and take them back to heaven with him. And this is an event known as as the great, the judgment seat of Christ after the rapture. And so our, our works will be evaluated. Believers will be judged for how they've lived on this earth at this time. And then comes the millennial kingdom. Well, the tribulation first. There'll be a seven-year period of tribulation that's described in Revelation 6 to 19. And then after the seven-year period of tribulation, Jesus Christ will return to earth. He comes. This is his second coming. It's not just his appearing in the cloud. This is his coming to earth to establish his millennial kingdom. Millennial means a thousand years. So he will reign for a thousand years. And we will be ruling and reigning with him depending and, and how much we'll be ruling and where we'll be ruling will be determined by how we've lived and as evaluated the judgment seat of Christ. And then at the end of the millennial kingdom, then comes the final judgment. As the dead from all time, all the unbelievers from all time will be resurrected, not to eternal life, but to second death. They'll be resurrected to face, as unbelievers are judged, the great white throne judgment. And they will be judged fairly and accordingly and found guilty and thrown into the lake of fire, the second death or as we commonly call it, hell. But there's two different judgments at two different times. And so I don't want you to get confused over these judgments. The judgment seat of Christ happens after the rapture, before Christ's second coming to earth. Now there's a third insight about this uh, judgment seat of Christ we need to understand. And that is the procedure of the judgment seat at the judgment seat will be intense. They are intensive. The methods used at this time of accountability are extremely thorough. God leaves no stone unturned. So the methods at this time of accountability uh, are intensive. So let's look at some of these uh, intensive facts. First of all, this judgment will be inevitable. That means it's going to happen. It's, gonna, it's certain. Our accountability is certain. There's so many people that live today, their Christian life, thinking they're not going to be accountable for how they live. Their sins are forgiven, and so they're not going to be held accountable for how they live. So they go live like the devil. Well, got news for them. They're going to be a great surprise at the judgment seat of Christ. They will be in heaven, but they will be evaluated. And it says they'll either be rewarded or suffer loss. Some are going to suffer loss. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But the scriptures speak of the certainty of the judgment for believers. And we see this in Romans 14, 10, our passage, we all stand before the judgment seat of God. We see it in 1 Corinthians 3, 13, each man's work, believer's work in the context of 1 Corinthians, will become evident. The day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. The fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. And so in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one will be recompensed or rewarded for his deeds in the body according to what he's done, whether good or bad. 
So this judgment is inevitable. It's as certain as the sunrise. It will happen. There's no escaping it. You and I will be held accountable for how we live as a Christian on this earth. Second fact about the intensity of this judgment. It's not only inevitable, it's also inclusive. Now what do I mean by inclusive? Every believer will be evaluated at the judgment seat of Christ. Two times in Scripture it says we must all stand. All means everybody. No exclusion, no exceptions, no exemptions. We shall all stand, it says in Romans 14.10, before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So every Christian will be included. There's no exceptions. The weak and the strong, the mature and the uh, spiritual, uh, the immature, the carnal, the spiritual, the faithful, the unfaithful, Every single Christian is going to be evaluated at this time. We all must face the evaluation at the judgment seat of Christ. All inclusive. Third fact, this judgment will be, well, I said, so we all, just emphasizing the all in these verses. Third fact is it's an individual Judgment. Each person will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. Now there's a big debate going on whether we'll all be there but whether we'll all see the individual judgment, is this like a big uh, projector screen, you know, where everything we've done is projected up there for everybody to see, or is this just an individual thing? I think it's individual, yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's, there's debate over that. Uh, but uh, although every Christian will be present this event, each Christian will be judged individually. And it says each one of us will give an account. Each one will be recompensed for his deeds. Each man's work will become evident. And so, what will Jesus say to you at the judgment seat of Christ? Will he say, well done, good and faithful servant? Or will he say, you worthless service servant, didn't you know you'd be held accountable? So, that's where some of the embarrassment and shame and, and loss comes at the judgment seat of Christ. Because we will be held accountable. So it's in inevitable, inclusive, individual, third or fourth fact, it's impartial. The judgment seat, uh, the judgment will be impartial. The one judges is perfectly independent. He's not influenced by outside sources. Uh, Romans 2, 11, there is no impartiality with God. So the judgment's perfect. Christ will judge each person fairly and impartially. For example, and this is from our passage in Romans 14, 14, I know and am convinced in terms of the weaker and stronger brethren, whether they're eating meat or not eating meat, uh, that nothing is unclean in itself. To him who thinks it's un to be unclean, to him it is unclean. And so at the judgment seat, he who doubts is condemned if he eats. Because his eating is not from faith. And whatever is not from faith is sin. And, and so, um, and then uh, James tells us, uh, let not many of you become teachers, my brethren. Why? Knowing that as such, we shall incur a stricter judgment. So when's a stricter judgment? At the judgment seat of Christ. It's not the great white throne. It's the judgment seat of Christ. We're judged for our teaching. That's why I study so hard during the week. Because I want to make sure that what I preach and teach from this pulpit, uh, I'm convinced is, is what is true. And I'll be held accountable. And maybe some of the things uh, I may not have gotten right. And I do my best as I can uh, in the research and study that I do to present what, in context, I believe the Scripture says. But I'm going to be held accountable for that. And, uh, and Rick, when he preaches, he's accountable for that too. <laughs> and, and you, when you teach in your Sunday schools and things, you know, and I know this is, nobody's going to ever teach after this. So. <laughs> no, no, no. We need teachers. We need good teachers. But just, just remember that, hey, you know, that uh, with, with that greater knowledge comes greater responsibility and greater accountability. And, and so, um, 
There's a fifth uh, intensive nature of this judgment. It's inevitable, inclusive, individual, and partial, but it's also introspective. Now, uh, what I mean by introspective, Christ will appear and peer into the inner recesses of our soul. And every, he's going to examine every thought, every word, every action, every attitude, every motive. And you think, mm, man, <laughs> Hebrews 4.13. There's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Now, this can be very comforting if we've lived in faithful obedience for Christ and, and we've done the good works that God wanted us to do, but it can be very challenging and very convicting uh, because we may not have done everything God wanted us to do. We may have been living for ourselves instead of the Savior. We may be living a worthless Christian life. Uh, or a workless Christian life, not doing the good works that we've done uh, or supposed to do. And this will be evaluating uh, as well. So this may not be a very happy time for some Christians. It may be a very painful time for some Christians. Another insight we need to look at, and that's the purposes of the judgment seat. And these are informative. The purpose of the judgment seat of Christ is to properly evaluate us, to grade us, so that our position in the coming kingdom may be clear. This is not a judgment to determine eternal destiny. It's a judgment to determine eternal duty. The great white throne is for our destiny. The judgment seat of Christ is for our duty, because we're already in heaven. That issue is not salvation. At the judgment seat of Christ, the issue is not whether we're saved or not. We are saved because we have believed in Jesus Christ and our sins are forgiven. And so we're there as believers with our sins forgiven. The issue is not about sin. It's about service, what we've done or not done for the Lord. And so what will be judged as our service, whether we've been faithful or unfaithful, as good stewards of the spiritual gifts and abilities that God has given to us. And some uh, may be disqualified from certain areas of service in the kingdom. Paul writes about this. And man, I don't want to be disqualified. What's he talking about? Not getting into heaven? No, no, no. He's already going to be in heaven. He's talking about disqualified from his service in the kingdom, from his closeness to Jesus Christ. The proximity, and I, I really think that uh, the, the more faithful we are in our service to Christ, the, the closer we will be physically to the Lord Jesus and his kingdom. And uh, instead of serving in the outer, outer skirts of the, of the kingdom, we'll be closer to it based on our faithful obedience. There are at least four areas of uh, of examination that, that Christ explores in, in this judgment. And uh, so uh, Christ will bring to light all hidden things. Luke 12, 2 tells us this. There is nothing covered up that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. So everything shows up at the judgment seat of Christ. So he'll bring to light all things hidden. And that means our thoughts and intentions will be judged. We already looked at this in Hebrews 4.13. There's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are laid open and bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So thoughts and intentions will be judged. As well as motives. Motives will be judged. Matthew 12.36. Jesus said, I say to you that every careless word that men shall speak, they shall render account of it. At the day of judgment. The day of judgment here is not the great white throne. I think it's the judgment seat of Christ. So we'll be judged and held accountable for our very words. And then our motives. In 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore do not go on passing judgment. That's what the Romans are doing in the context of our passage. The Corinthians were doing the same thing. 
Don't judge before the time. But before what time? Before the time of the judgment seat of Christ. That's where judgment's going to happen. We don't have the right and authority to do that before that time. Wait till the Lord comes. The Lord comes in the clouds at the rapture. Who will both bring to light the things that are hidden in darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts. Because that's what's going to be evaluated. It's not just the actions. You may give $1,000 to a ministry. And, but what's your motive? If your motive is to get your name written on a wall, uh, I'm not sure how much recognition you're going to get for that, the judgment of Christ, because the motives are evaluated there. Is it for our service for the Lord, for doing it out of a pure heart? Each man's praise will come from God. And, and so, so, yeah, we're, he's going to bring to light things that are hidden. He's going to hold us accountable for how we've lived. So Erwin Lutzer, who is a former president of Moody Bible Institute, said if we should, if we should, pass, we should not pass judgment before the time, if we should not pass judgment before the time, it could only because, be because the unresolved disputes among believers will be adjudicated at the Bema. There are all the injustice among God's children to be brought to light. Truth will triumph and the righteous will be vindicated. Is this not why Paul told us not to take our own revenge, to leave room for the wrath of God? Uh, Romans 12, 19. And he goes on to say, At the beam of the false accusations leveled against you will be brought to light. Cruelty, gossip, misunderstanding will be cleared up. The judgment will be as detailed as it has to be to satisfy justice. All the he said and she said arguments will cease. Here the specifics are finally revealed. Nothing but facts, nothing but truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. If you need vindication, you will have it. If you need to be shown where you're in error, you'll have that too. <laughs> Woodrow Close says, um, just as the daylight brings uh, light from the sun to reveal the hidden things of darkness, so that day, the day of the judgment seat of Christ, will bring light from the Son, Jesus Christ, to reveal the hidden things of darkness. So however many hidden things which are, are good will be revealed as well. Uh, it will both be a day of vindication and a day of disappointment. But we're going to be held accountable for how we've lived. We're responsible for how we've lived. And as Romans, our passage says in Romans uh, 14, 12, each one of us shall give an account of himself to God. That term, give account, is a counting term. It's one that's used by a bookkeeper putting an account, uh, a thing in the ledger. And so we'll give an account for our words, our actions, our attitudes, our thoughts, our motives, Everything will be having to give an account. Our time, talent, and treasure, give an account for how we've used that as well. So the concept of being held accountable for how we live ought to challenge the socks off of the, of the Christian who's complacent and apathetic and lukewarm in their Christian living. That's why this is so important. It motivates us to serve faithfully, to live godly, to love unconditionally, to work diligently, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor is not in vain because God sees it. He's going to reward it at the judgment seat of Christ. Even if nobody else sees it, God will reward you. He's not so unjust so as to forget our works and the labor of love. He will also test the quality of our works. And that's what 1 Corinthians 3 is all about. Um, talking about Apollos and Paul, the servants whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted Apollos water. God causes the growth. And, and so, uh, so neither the one who plants or the one who waters is anything, but God causes growth. And now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward. Where? At the judgment seat of Christ. According to his own labor, according to what they have done. So, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, what he's done, good or bad. And so there's a, there's a testing. If any man's builds upon the foundation, the foundation is Jesus Christ, 
And we build upon it with kinds of materials, gold, silver, and precious stones. Those are permanent things, good works, or wood, hay, and straw. Those are fleshly things, and those are not lasting, temporary, selfish things. And so each man's work will become evident. The day of, of judgment seat of Christ will show it because it's to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. And if any man's work remains, he'll receive a reward. If, he, if it's burned up, he'll suffer loss, but he himself will be saved. So that's through his fire. So it's a quality of work that will be tested. And so uh, gold, silver, and stone are the works of, done in the power of the Spirit uh, for the glory of Christ. And the wood, hay, and straw are the works done in the flesh for selfish reasons and motives, and, and they'll be burned up. So um, there's another area. Just think about what kind of materials are you building uh, on the superstructure of your foundation in Christ? Are the things you're building lasting and going to be wood, hay, and straw? Uh, not lasting, wood, hay, and straw. Are they going to be permanent, gold, silver, and precious stone? He'll also reward for faithful service. He'll compensate us for our sacrificial obedience to him. 1 Corinthians 3.14. If any man's work which he has built upon it remains, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he'll suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so is through fire. So at the judgment seat, we're going to be rewarded or we're going to suffer loss. Now what's the loss? The loss is not salvation. No, why? Because uh, we appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Each one may be recompensed in his body for that which he's done, good or bad. So we're recompensed for God, we're recompensed for bad. But, but what, are, what are the rewards? Let's talk about the rewards first, okay? Because God's not so unjust so as to forget our work. And the love which we have shown toward his name and having ministered and still ministering to the saints. And Hebrews tells us that, uh, you know, when we come to God, it's by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him because he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. It's worth your while to live for God. It's a reward. He's going to reward. The reward's not heaven. The reward's what we do in heaven. So the, the last, our products at the judgment seat of Christ are instructive. But what comes as a result of this? Well, many will receive rewards for faithful service. Living the Christian life of faithful service and obedience will result in being recognized and rewarded at the Bema seat, at the judgment seat of Christ. And these rewards may take several forms. They may be in the form of crowns. Uh, so we may have the crown of righteousness, which is a, a crown given for those who wholeheartedly seek him with all their heart. Uh, the crown of glory, the, servant, the leader servant crown, the crown of rejoicing, the soul winner's crown, the incorruptible crown, the crown for self-discipline, the crown of life given to those who endure much suffering in this life. The rewards may not be just crowns. And what will we do with these crowns? Well, Revelation tells us that the 24 elders representing the church fall down before him. And this is the church in heaven as the tribulation, just before the tribulation takes place. Um, we sit at the throne, we'll worship him who lives forever and ever, and we'll cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy of the Lord, the Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. So the crowns are not for our glory. We're working for the crowns, but the crowns are for the glory of God and Christ. Uh, and so it's not, it's not us. It's, it's for, it all goes, you want to glorify God then, and you earn these crowns, not for your glory, for His glory. Another type of reward would be whether you, where you reign and rule as priest in the kingdom. And so uh, I like what John Wesley said, uh, whoever will reign with him, in, reign with Christ in heaven, must have Christ reigning in him on earth, Lord of your life. We live with Christ as the Lord of our life. 
and we're going to be obedient to him. And as we are faithful and obedient, we'll be rewarded and we will reign with him. Parable of the talents. You remember the parable of the talents? He gave talents to five and to two and to one. And he told him to go out and make more. And the guy with five went out and made five more. And what did he say to him? Well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful in little things. I will put you in charge of many things. And so uh, and our faithfulness in this life will determine what we're put in charge in, with in the millennial kingdom. So, but then the, the guy that didn't do anything, what did he say to him? Um, he said uh, he, he hid it and didn't do anything. So he rebuked him. He said, you lazy slave. Uh, I, mean, I, must, I must remind you the outcome of the judgment seat of Christ is not all positive. There will be loss. What kind of loss are we talking about? There may suffer loss. It's not loss of salvation. It's not loss of getting into heaven. It's a loss of rewards. It's a loss of the privilege of ruling closer to Christ than you could have. It's a loss of being a full regret and shame for a time, tears, at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, I don't think they're going to last for the thousand years. Now, they might, because when are tears wiped away? At the end of the millennium kingdom. At the beginning of the new heaven and new earth, as a new Jerusalem comes down, so he wipes away every tear. So, I don't know how long the, the, the shame and regret will last, but uh, the parable of the talents, he says, you, you wicked, lazy slave. It's a stinging rebu rebuke. He lost the approval of his master, and that's a real loss. So another insight and last insight we'll look at is just the practical implication of this to our lives. We need to live with a passion to please the Lord and gain the rewards for his glory, not our own, for his glory. And so it's inspiring the truth of our accountability as believers at the judgment seat should grab us and shake us and make us desire to live for Christ and, and the fear of consequences of not living for Christ. What do I gain if I do? What do I lose if I don't? And there are real possibilities we need to evaluate. We need to understand it's worth our while to live for Christ, to sacrifice ourselves and to give our bodies as a living sacrifice, to have our minds renewed so that we can be transformed to do the will of God that he wants us to do. So we need to, to live with a passion to please the Lord, gain the rewards. And we need to live with a healthy fear of loss because there will be loss at the judgment seat of Christ. So what's God saying to you and me this morning? As, as we look at these two different judgments at two different times, you need to make sure which judgment you're going to be at. And I can't make that determination for you, but you can look at your life and say, well, am I a believer or not a believer? If I'm an unbeliever, I'm going to go to the great white throne and, and be cast into the lake of fire, second death. And God doesn't want you to be there. God designed that for the devil and his angels. But if, and he's provided a way that you can not be there by sending his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross to pay for our sins so that we will not face the great white throne judgment and spend eternity in the lake of fire. If you believe in Jesus Christ, the one who died for you and rose again, then you will be part of those who will be raptured to be with Jesus and you will face the judgment seat of Christ, be evaluated for how you've lived, but you will be in eternity forever. But the question is, what will you be doing in eternity? And here's the life challenge. If you haven't got anything else out of this, and I started with this, and I'll end with this, what you do now as a Christian will determine what you will be doing later in the kingdom. Right now counts forever. It's worth your while to give your life to the Lord and to live for the Lord now. It's worth your while to, to live in sacrificial obedience to Christ because it will be rewarded for the glory of God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank You and praise You for this uh, study of the judgment seat of Christ. And Lord, I pray that we would not fear this, but Lord, that we would welcome this and look forward to being evaluated. 
uh, Lord, I know there will be loss, and, and even in the most mature Christian, you know, some of the stuff, wrong motives, they're going to be burned up. Uh, and Lord, we do uh, live with a healthy fear of that. And, and Lord, I know that uh, your word says when Jesus comes, uh, that some will shrink away in shame at his coming. Uh, and, and that's not the unbeliever, that's the believer who's swink, swink, sinking away in shame because of the way they've lived, a wasteful, unproductive life. Lord, we don't want to do that. And we want to live lives of productive service for you. And Lord, if there is one here that's struggling with which judgment they'll be at, and, th- and you're, you're convicting them that they've never come into a relationship with you through faith in Jesus Christ, that this morning they would do that in the quietness of their own heart. Just simply uh, acknowledge that they are sinners separated from you and believe that Jesus Christ died for their sins and rose so they could have eternal life with you forever. If you're making that decision, then please tell me or tell Rick or tell somebody you came with. We want to know whether you've made that decision to help you grow and mature in your Christian life. But for those that have believed in Christ, this is an issue that we need to be aware of, and it's a motivating issue for for Christians to live in obedience and to know that that it's going to be recognized, that it's not just for nothing, it's going to be rewarded. And, And it is worthwhile to live in sacrificial service for our Savior. Lord, we want to give all the glory and praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.